talk to you today about a Syria that you don't know and to try to show you a side of the Syrian conflict that has remained largely invisible since early 2011. For much of the past four years, I've worked with and observed the emerging, Syri emerging Syrian grassroots movement, looking at how Syrians in their villages, neighborhoods, and towns have adapted to the dramatically changing circumstances of their lives. But so much of the news today is focused on Syria as a war-ravaged country, as if it ceased to exist as a society. And I think the map of Syria that many people are familiar with is the ISIS map, the stretches of territory across Syria and Iraq that a, that a terrorist group calling itself Islamic State has occupied. But this map, for me, reduces what's going on in Syria today to violence, conflict, and geopolitics, as if it's a zoomed out satellite photo that is too far away to focus on what is happening on the ground today. Namely that Syrians, despite impossible odds, are striving every day to articulate through words and actions their vision for a future inclusive Syria. I believe that when we look at the Syrian conflict from the perspective of these people, the people who remain behind, we get a narrative of the Syrian conflict that is very different to the purely militarized one. I want to try to illustrate this by looking at two North Syrian cities, Aleppo and Ra'a, that get a lot of media attention today as major battlefields in the Syrian conflict. Aleppo's significance is that it is Syria's largest city and its industrial and commercial center. Fighting over Aleppo has been ongoing since June, July 2012 and hundreds and thousands of people have been evacuated. And today it's split into two zones, one occupied by the regime and one occupied by the opposition. Its residents suffer from periodic aerial bombardment from the regime and encroaching ISIS on its outskirts and a chronic shortage in basic supplies and services. But despite this great hardship, Aleppo has witnessed the rise in dozens and dozens of grassroots groups playing multiple roles. It's very difficult for me today to give justice and to acknowledge all of these groups, like, for example, the Revolutionary Youth of Aleppo, that transformed their actions from protesting to self-organized governance, running schools and hospitals, treating traumatized women and children, and trying to run basic state services like collecting garbage and, and trying to run you know, power generation and electricity. And what I've learned over the past couple of years is how ordinary citizens with no experience on the ground and no political ambition transform into agents of change when public space is open to them. Marcel Shahwaro is a young Syrian dentist from Aleppo turned blogger and activist. And like many young Syrians, she chose to express her activism not just by protesting in the street, but by trying to play an active role in public life. And when I met her earlier this year, the first thing she said to me, you know, I'm not really interested in politics and I don't care about political parties and elections. But what, was, what I found also amazing, it was that she was keenly aware, for example, of how important education was in the struggle for Syria's future. So she and a group of Aleppo friends who, from various professional backgrounds, with no experience at all in teaching school kids, decided to try to set the blueprint for an independent education system to, as a way to keep Syrian communities together. So they set up an organization called Kishmalak, which amazingly, despite the violence in and around Aleppo, is trying to run a number of schools free from ideology and religious dogma and focused on non-violence as a way of life. All of this comes at great personal risk and sacrifice because activists like Marcel, who work on the ground, have to contend with the dozens of armed and extremist groups who have their own agenda, especially when it comes to education and who also are trying to occupy public space. Marcel, earlier this year, was briefly kidnapped because she was protesting in public without wearing a veil. And she's spoken and written about how she's had to move house frequently to escape so-called arrest from extremist groups. 
And what we, begin, what we begin to see here is how citizens in Syria are trying to take charge of their lives and, how, and build foundations, new foundations for their country, and how even with periodic violence around them, they're trying to change the structures and the ways of the past and to build new, a new identity. And I found also how stories from Aleppo, stories of hardship from Aleppo and other cities, always come with accounts of sometimes really extraordinary human agency. Earlier this year, a water crisis erupted in Aleppo. And this was reported in some of the regional press. But there was no attention paid to, not just that there were protests, because what happened was an extremist group called Jabhat al-Nusra in the opposition side took control of the main water city uh, pump and they cut off water to the opposition side of the city. But of course what they ended up doing was cutting off water to the entire city. Citizens protested, but they also set up an, an initiative to fit pickup trucks with mobile water tanks and pumps to pump water from city wells to houses. And I also found it interesting that they also set guidelines for water distribution and purification. Citizen, I mean, civil society activists from Aleppo and from, from all over Syria have told me over the past couple of years, over and over again, we represent order and not chaos. And I just want to pause here a bit and also say that it's not just these attempts at citizen-led governance that show how Syrians are trying to occupy public space. There's been an explosion of creativity in Syria since 2011. Syrians use the arts not just to express their identities, but also to challenge violence and lawlessness. A couple of weeks ago, I was scrolling down my Facebook page, and I was amazed to see this very obscure post shared by a Syrian friend advertising an amateur theatre group in Aleppo called Breadway which is a pun on, pun on Broadway, but also a message that we need culture as well as bread to live. And I thought, you know, with all these bombs and aggression happening around uh, Aleppo, they are still staging a play which they've called Dakakin, or Shops, which criticizes how people profit from war and how they adopt the ideals of whoever pays them the most. And um, there's been so much, and I want to link this to the immediate attention that I think many people see about, for example, how people leave their lives to join ISIS, but so little attention to people who stayed committed to nonviolence and civil action, precisely because of the violence around them. And I see how recently grassroots groups have been increasingly desperate to reaffirm this belief, not just to themselves, but to the outside world. Many, so many, are always tempted to leave a war zone, and many do leave because they're burnt out, they're exhausted, and they're so disillusioned with how violence is beginning to reverse so much of their achievements on the ground. But even today, it's amazing that I still see determination to keep these achievements alive. And I think that it's this view of Aleppo that we should keep in mind, and not always Aleppo the battlefield. If we move a little east, we go to Ra'a. Ra'a is, is a city that before the war had a population of 25,000. And if you've been watching the news on Syria lately, it often pops up as the de facto capital of ISIS, or its stronghold. But what is missing here is how Syrian civil society tried to keep their narrative alive. When the government forces left the city or abandoned the city in March 2013, newly formed grassroots organizations like the Hakuna or our right movement moved in and tried to keep a semblance of normal life going. It wasn't easy, but they tried, they set up youth recreation centers, they staged public plays, and they tried to lift people's spirits by um, launching a campaign where they painted street walls and neighborhoods and tried to animate public swear squares by plays and creative activities. And this later became a, became a campaign 
to get rid of the slogans of ISIS. They did, you know, simple, basic stuff like distributing bread, but also to cope with aerial bombardment of their city, they set up civil defense teams. But all of this today is nearly dead, or basically it's dead, because they were unable to withstand, despite great nonviolent resistance, and by women especially, the brutal takeover of their city by ISIS. ISIS deliberately targeted civil society, and it assassinated many activists. And the activists that have managed to flee Ra'a, and the ones I've spoken to, are really aware, they're so aware that they lost this narrative of their city to ISIS. So they launched a campaign called Ra'a is being slaughtered silently, not just to challenge ISIS, but as a cry for our attention. For me, the story of Ra'a is not that it is ISIS's de facto capital, but that for a long time, grassroots groups tried to provide an alternative leadership and to practice nonviolence against brutality wherever it came from. And I think for many Syrians, the enduring image of Ra'a is the one woman campaign of nonviolent resistance led by teacher Suad Naufal, who for many months, starting in July 2013, and until, and until she had to flee to Turkey, marched every day through the streets of the city towards ISIS's headquarters, holding out banners, denouncing their methods and their manipulation of religion. Now, imagine if we take all of these things and we put them together and we think of the past four years, all the creativities, the initiatives and the actions, we don't just see human resilience, I think we get a picture of what Syria's future might look like. And everything I've mentioned today and I've spoken about is not happening in secret and it's not hidden. I don't have privileged information. These are public activities and actions documented on the internet every day by alternative Syrian media outlets. But what they're missing today is attention and recognition because otherwise they're invisible. And when they're invisible, we no longer see them as part of the solution or, the prime, or as the prime stakeholders in peace. Today, Syrian grassroots groups and citizens find it very difficult to make their case that they are the best people to rebuild their cities and run their lives when international focus is only on the factions on the ground waging war and destruction. Conflicts like the Syrian conflict are not just geopolitical events, they're very deeply human events. And when we only focus on borders and politics, we miss people on the ground trying their best to build their lives and their future. I think that when we change the way that we frame the Syrian conflict and the armed conflicts in general, and we, we focus on citizen-led governance and grassroots groups practicing armed violence against violence and in extremism, we get a glimpse of a country's future beyond war. Thank you. Thank you. So someone here who wants to get involved yep. and connect with some of these groups, how can they do that? Well, I mean, as I said, nothing, everything I've spoken about today is not hidden and it's not secret. So there are some emerging Syrian media outlets that I can, maybe I can, I don't know if I can mention them now, that yes. uh, like, for example, there's a project called Syria Untold. And if you just Google Syria Untold, you'll go to the website that is beginning to document, not just to document, it's not just important to post videos and photos, it's to frame and to show, to give a narrative of the story. This, this is one way that you can do these things. And they, they put phone numbers and they put emails and the information is there. And you're here the next couple of days, you're, mm. you would welcome and conversations from people. And I'm happy to give as much information and as much yeah, access as possible. Thanks yeah. so much, Dorian. Thank you. Thanks.